All right, horrible pronunciation warning at the onset, because this is going to be a lot of uh, Japanese terms. So we're looking at a screen, as you can tell, and the uh, the name for Japanese screens, which were inherited from China, essentially, uh, translates as wind screen. So the term is biobu, something along that, those lines, and uh, that's what it was. It was a wind screen. The houses were really open, and you'd put these up, just like in China, and it would help give a little privacy, but especially break up the, the breeze. Well, you know, in that typically Japanese way, of course, this became not only an art, but a refined art, and one that they just continued to keep refining. One of their innovations was paper hinges. So if you look on here, it's almost like one complete canvas for the artist to work with. And using the paper and getting rid of the metal, kind of typical door hinges, allowed that. So now you have a broad canvas to work with. Pretty cool. And around 1600, when the Momoyama period started, these started to become status symbols as well. Gold leaf especially started to be employed, and here we go. This is a perfect example, right? This one comes from right around this time. It's by an artist named Tosa Mitsuyoshi, and it tells a tale that's connected with the Isa Shrine in Japan. Now, the Isa Shrine is the most important Shinto shrine in Japan, and of course that was their native religion or belief system, and it has a bunch of fascinating rituals associated with it. Uh, the most notable is that it's rebuilt every 20 years. It's related to the sun goddess, Ama Terasu, uh, and that's interesting. So there's a goddess at the top of the pantheon. So just like in Rome, you had Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, but of course it was, you know, a male god or symbol. So that's interesting, but that rebuilding, I think, would probably represent kind of the sun going down and coming back, you know, death and rebirth, that kind of thing. And it's just such a wonderfully Japanese, you know, kind of do way thing to do, just this act of constant, you know, work, instead of just leaving it there and preserving it. Uh, and here's the bridge leading to it, which I believe is also rebuilt uh, every 20 years. And, uh, you know, just add this to the list of, like, one million things I want to do if I ever uh, get to Japan, is, is go see this. So the tale captured on the screen associated with this shrine is part of a series, a long series, like 143 episodes uh, in poem form, and it was written about 1000 AD. And here you go, action scene. These are the bad guys. Uh, here are retainers of the provincial governor who have been sent to basically hunt down an eloping couple. So you've got star-crossed lovers, and of course what caught my eye right away when I walked by this screen were the weapons. So going from right to left, you've got a, well, all overview. You've got a Naginata, right, that's that halberd, you know, spear-type weapon over there on the right. A Yumi, that's a traditional Japanese bow in the middle, and then a Katana in hand over on the left. And there's more than one sword in the overall uh, arsenal. And some of you might not be aware that art is of primal importance in studying the history of weaponry because it's the visual record. Short of the invention of photography, this is what you had to go on. So whether it was a sculpture on a tomb showing a warrior, uh, a screen like this, paintings, drawings, you know, fight manuals from the Middle Ages in Europe, you name it, uh, this is where you went. So here we've got a close-up of these two guys, and you see the torch over in one man's right hand, and that's because they're going to burn the lovers out of the uh, the weeds, the tall grass that they're hiding in. As you can see, one of them is armored, one of them is not, and they both have swords, the sheaths of which are on the uh, left side of the body, which matches tradition. And now let's get to the archer. So, you know, anyone who has just a stereotypical Western superficial understanding of a Japanese warrior class, a samurai, would not know that the Yumi, the bow, was of absolute primal importance. Uh, it's interesting because, of course, the katana has been called the soul of the samurai, which it really absolutely was, but the yumi was, again, of just prime, prime importance. These are mounted, when they had a horse, <laughs> you know, archers in large part. And Japanese warriors throughout history took tremendous pride in their skill with a bow. Now, the classic Japanese bow, it evolved, uh, you know, so many things do, uh, do uniquely, on Japan, uh, the classic Yumi is asymmetrical, which right away makes it very easy to spot within like the history of, of bows and arrows. Generally tend to be really, really tall and again asymmetrical. So it's a very clever design where you get an equal pull from both sides, but you're not grabbing the bow in the center. And if you'll notice, uh, that's how this guy is holding it, right? It's about two-thirds of the way down. 
you could go on and on about Japanese archery and the many art forms and kind of meditative practices that came out of it. So let's move on though, because we are going to. So uh, here's another guy with a torch, another meanie. He's going to burn down the uh, the weeds, and you can see he's partially armored as well, just like one of the previous guys. And that's kind of worthy of note as well. Japanese warriors didn't always wear like a full suit of armor. You could walk around in kind of a, you know, half baked version like this. Now, his friend is holding another classic Japanese weapon, a naginata. Naginata is obviously a polearm type weapon, and with the Japanese love of swords, it's kind of a combination of a sword and a spear. There was a lot of variation in naginata design in terms of size of the shaft and of the blade. The blade could sometimes be up to two feet long, so you could see it really was, in some cases, almost a sword on the end of a pole. Naginata use started up around 800 AD and a uh, continued on. Of course, it's Japan, so there's people still using it and practicing with it today. There's a lot of lore around it involving female warriors and monks, just all kinds of stuff, but we're just skimming the surface here. And lastly, because we are reviewing the screen itself, or it is a work of art, here are the forlorn lovers. And now that you know what's going on plot-wise, you can see that the uh, use of space here was purposeful. I, you know, the little placard attached to this mentioned it, and I think it's quite correct. Uh, it kind of shows the, the forlorn hope of the, uh, the eloping couple. So, if you wanted to know what a decoration in a, you know, Lord's House circa 1600 Japan would have looked like, here is a very fine example. Thanks.